Greetings, I'm Senator James Sanders, Jr. The show you're about to watch will discuss the COVID-19 vaccine, and it has stirred up quite a bit of controversy with people bashing the nature of the show uh, because they are concerned about what we are presenting. For the record, I would like to say I support the COVID-19 vaccine. I believe it's safe. I plan to take the vaccine publicly as soon as it becomes available, and I encourage my constituents to take the vaccine as well. Having said that, my friends, we do live in a country where our Constitution guarantees freedom of speech. So I think it will be a disservice to the community and to the greater public to try to censor or hide unpopular points of view. My friends, we can disagree. We can even get angry when we hear things that deviate from our beliefs and norms. But on my show, let's be clear, we represent all points of view. My friends, this is one of the most uh, difficult issues that we're going to deal with. This is an issue that is so filled with everything. 400 years of American history, uh, there's problems with the sordid history, medical history of especially blacks and, and vaccines of every type. Then you have, you just have reasons on top of reasons on top of reasons to be concerned. But I have complete faith in my audience. I believe that they will listen to the show with an open mind and make decisions based on the facts. And my friends, I have faith in you. I believe that at the end of this show, you'll agree with me. The vaccine is the lesser of two evils. In fact, the vaccine is good. I think we all should do it, but I want you to do it with an open mind and I want you to do it weighing and measuring all that you need to hear from the best people who can put those positions out. And having said that, my friends, let's be clear. I trust that you will watch this show as if your life depends on it, because indeed it may. Thank you very much. Good afternoon and welcome to Let's Be Clear. I am your host, Senator James Sanders, Jr., and in a day of fuzzy thinking, in a day where you can't get a straight answer from anybody, especially in my line of work politics, isn't it refreshing that there's a place where we can be clear, where we prize ourselves in clear answers to clear questions. The simpler the question deserves a simple answer. So, and that's what we do here, my friends, and I'm really glad that you're, you're here. Today, we're going to discuss vaccinations. And you know what? That is the issue of the world, not just the nation. Uh, the question is, should we get the shot or not? Should we find our way to roll up our sleeves on this one? Or, or should we pick up our heels and start running? Now, we're going to hear from a host of people. Of course, we're talking about a very serious subject. We're talking about COVID-19, a, a dreaded illness that has taken 400,000 American lives and so many more throughout the world. Uh, and we, we pause for a second or two to pay homage to those who have died. Now that we have done that, my friends, the question becomes, we had an Operation Warp Speed, a, a, a way of getting a, the, a, a, um, a vaccination to the American people in warp speed in an incredible amount of time. And as the pre former president said, instead of nine years, nine months. This has raised many questions from many people. A, can you deliver a vaccination with the proper safeguards in such a short period of time? We may even question, is there an illness to begin with? Uh, can we deliver such a, a vaccination to the American people in a short period of time 
or is this something that we need to hold up about and let's see this one through? Uh, we're going to start with two people who, who have a, a short period of time to be here. Uh, Mr. Big Tree, uh, why don't you give us the 30 seconds of who you are? And I believe that you, uh, Barbara, that you're going to be speaking with him uh, and who, who you are and then you can go straight into your position on this matter. Sir, good to see you. Thank you for having me, Senator Sanders. I appreciate this opportunity. I am the CEO of the Informed Consent Action Network. We are a consumer advocacy group. Our mission statement is dedicated to eradicating man-made disease. We believe that there is a lot of disease and illness caused by toxic chemicals, uh, both in our food, our water, our air supply. So we investigate things like that. My background was I was a CBS uh, producer for the daytime talk show, The Doctors. That's a medical talk show where I spent six years celebrating the best that medicine has to offer. I won an Emmy Award doing that show. My life changed when I stumbled upon a whistleblower at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention named Dr. William Thompson, who came forward in 2014 uh, with the confession that the CDC had committed scientific fraud on vaccine safety studies, specifically the study looking at the MMR autism study. Does the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine have a causal relationship with autism? And what he did was provide 10,000 documents showing that they threw out very critical information when they saw a connection between the vaccines and autism. I started my nonprofit after releasing a documentary about that issue. That documentary was called Vax. My nonprofit, the Informed Consent Action Network, has continued to look beyond just the MMR vaccine and study the safety of all vaccines given to our children. And what we've discovered is that not a single childhood vaccine has ever gone through the double-blind inert placebo study. This is the gold standard uh, for all safety studies of pharmaceutical products, vaccines are not going through that process. That's why we got directly involved with the COVID-19 uh, vaccine trials. Uh, we petitioned the FDA and demanded that they add a saline placebo group, the true gold standard study, to the phase three trials of the COVID-19 vaccine. And I am happy to say that the a FDA acquiesced uh, changed their protocol, which was going to use another vaccine to compare to, and instead are using a saline placebo group. But we do have concerns about the length of that safety trial. As we know, a study that was supposed to last multiple years with 30,000 people in one group, 45,000, uh, when we talk about Moderna and Pfizer, that has been truncated and it's gone from years into weeks and now this vaccine has been released upon the public is a completely experimental product. Um, this is like no vaccine that's ever been made before, where usually a vaccine, we're injecting some form of a killed or attenuated virus uh, so that the immune system responds. We, you know, get the immune system to respond and create antibodies. In this case, uh, with both Moderna and Pfizer, it is a brand new technology uh, not really natural in origin. Essentially, we're sending a message called messenger RNA. Uh, uh, usually, the DNA sends out messages to our cells to create proteins to keep the balance that we have in our bodies. What we're doing is inserting an artificial message, and we're sending it to our cells, and they're telling the cells to actually create the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. Essentially, we're turning Brother our Dale, cells. Only yes. because this is a layman audience. Yes. I'm going to bring you to, and I'm going to ask you to be clear. Is this vaccine safe or not? There is no way to determine that a vaccine is safe when you only do a trial for several weeks. Uh, what we need are multi-year trials like every drug we take goes through. That is because in this case, when we're messing with RNA and messaging and telling our cells to become what I was going to call a virus manufacturing plant, we are making our body create the virus. It's the first attempt to do something like this. We need to know the long-term effects of that. Does that end up, does that cycle of our cells creating the virus in our body, does it ever stop? Do we lead to long-term autoimmune issues? Uh, or does it cause cancer in the future? You can rush and warp speed the development of a product, but you cannot warp speed safety. The only way to go through a safety trial is to give the product enough time that we see the long-term effects. 
in this case, autoimmune diseases and cancers and things like that could take two years, five years. And ultimately, when we start talking about changing the mechanisms of RNA and DNA, as many of these vaccines do, we should be looking at multiple generations. How does it affect the children of people that receive this vaccine? That could take decades. Now, I'm going to stop you there because your, your basic point, I believe, has been put across very well. Uh, Barbara, what, what say you to this issue? Well, I'm co-founder and president of the nonprofit National Vaccine Information Center, founded in 1982 by parents of DPT vaccine-injured children. We launched the vaccine safety and informed consent movement in this country in the late 20th century. We worked with Congress on the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act of 1986 to secure informing, recording, reporting, and research provisions in that law that was the first law to acknowledge that vaccines do carry uh, risks that can be greater for some people than other people. And uh, we have since that time monitored vaccine safety policy and law in this country. Uh, I wanna make it clear that we do not make vaccine use recommendations. We believe uh, that the informed consent ethic must be protected, which means you have the right, the human right, to be fully informed about the benefits and risks of a medical intervention, like the use of a pharmaceutical product, like a vaccine, and be able to make a voluntary decision. So we we encourage everyone to become fully informed about the risks and complications of diseases and vaccines. And we, we support the right to make that decision voluntarily and not be threatened or coerced or sanctioned for the decision made. So we support the availability of COVID-19 vaccines without barriers for anyone who wants to choose to get vaccinated, but we oppose forced vaccination. That is requirements to get a COVID shot. We're on the record in multiple states, including New York State, as opposing the elimination of flexible medical, religious, and conscience belief exemptions such as we did in 2019, and we are on record as opposing the current legislation proposed in the assembly to mandate COVID-19 vaccine, because coercion and force should force should not be used uh, in the area of vaccination. It's a violation of the informed consent, I think, and it causes fear and distrust of government health policies and laws and the doctors who enforce them, because trust once lost is very hard to regain. And I learned firsthand as a young mother that the risks of vaccination can turn out to be 100% for some children. Because while we're not, while we are born equal under the law, we're not born all the same. And we don't all respond the same way to pharmaceutical products like vaccines or to infectious diseases. And we've seen that in this COVID-19 pandemic. So we believe every life has value and that those who are harmed by vaccines deserve equal protection uh, as those who are harmed by infectious diseases. Now, the Institute of Medicine in 2012 acknowledged that there's individual susceptibility to vaccine uh, adverse uh, responses and that doctors cannot tell ahead of time who is going to be harmed. There are only two contraindications to the two experimental messenger RNA COVID vaccines that are manufactured by Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, the two approved contraindications are, and, and again, this, these vaccines have been released under emergency use authorization. Uh, they have not been licensed yet. They are still experimental. Uh, this is the first time that the American population has been given vaccines under an emergency use authorization. In other words, they haven't been licensed yet. Um, so the two contraindications are number one, Anyone who has an immediate allergic reaction uh, of any severity to any component of the COVID-19 vaccine, such as uh, polyethylene glycol or to polysorbate, uh, those people should not get vaccinated, says the CDC. Unfortunately, most people don't know if they're allergic to polyethylene glycol or polysorbate. In addition, CDC says uh, people who develop severe allergic reactions, such as anaphylaxis, after a first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, should not receive a second dose. But there are millions of people with a personal history of severe allergic reactions, including potentially fatal anaphylactic shock reactions to food, prescription drugs, and vaccines. I'm one of those people. And they may be at risk 
for anaphylaxis following the COVID-19 vaccine. But a previous anaphylactic reaction to those substances is not a contraindication. In now, addition- Ms. Barbara, only because I have a lay audience. So you're saying, I, if I've heard you correct, you have said, uh, you, and you've put up several uh, allergies that people should have. So mm -hmm. yours is an organization that people can get in touch with uh, if they need more information on yes. making a con a, uh, a a real choice, a, a an informed right. scent. I like that. Right. Now, I'm going to take. I will come back to you. Okay. But Dr. Morris, Dr. Morris. So you so, agree with Mr. Big Tree that uh, we shouldn't do any of this. Let's just go <laughs> on home uh, and we'll call it a day. Okay, so let's put it in the context of everything here. I'm the chief medical officer of St. John's Episcopal Hospital. Uh, we are the only inpatient hospital on a geographically isolated peninsula here in Queens. We service over 140,000 uh, patients on a peninsula. And a majority of our patients at this point in time, unfortunately suffer from healthcare disparities. And I put that in the context of our discussion today in the respect of, I think that everybody should have informed consent and make decisions on their own. And the issue is, is as we look at Esther and St. John's is our, um, our part in all of vaccinations or any kind of healthcare is healthcare literacy is of ultimate importance that as Barbara had stated just a little while ago, it's an individual decision and it's an informed consent. And informed consent has to show you about the risks, the benefits and the alternatives to any medication or vaccines. And this is an individual decision for individual people. As we work in a hospital with over 2000 individuals, when we rolled out our vaccine uh, program, a tremendous component of not just the access to the vaccine is, is but the literature behind it and putting out CDC information, putting out the risks, benefits and alternatives and trying to make sure that employees understand and give an informed decision as to whether they decide to take it or not. This is definitely not required and we are frontline uh, healthcare uh, workers. Um, to put it in perspective, we were unfortunately servicing the second deadliest zip code in all of New York back in the spring. That being said, it's our, um, our um, actually, uh, our authority, our, uh, you know, a responsibility more so in the community to make sure the information goes out in the vaccine and how we can best approach COVID as a community and make a smart decision. And individuals can make the smart decision without being forced to do anything. Well, then let me ask you two questions and I'm coming to you, Ms. Muir, in a moment. In, in your A, in your professional opinion, is this vaccine safe? And B, would you take it? Okay, so two things. You know, I'm an obstetrician by training and I'm somewhat of a scientist and a clinician at the same time. I take a look at the literature. I took a look at the risks, benefits and alternatives and put it all together. Would I have liked to have 10 years to take a look and get you know, tremendous information associated with it, what, like all vaccines are. And I think Mr. Big Tree had made some great points and had touched on certain points that this was a fairly compressed uh, time period as far as letter, medical literature is. But the individual decision that I've made for myself, looking at the risk benefits and alternatives, again, I did receive the vaccine, but that's a decision I made for myself. I don't impose that on anybody else. I try to educate our community our staff members and other individuals about the vaccine. And this is solely an individual a decision. I cannot make a decision for others. I can provide the information as best possible on both sides. I shouldn't be biased. I should sit and try to give people as much information as I can because I'm not looking to change anybody's mind because I don't walk in their shoes. Now, why did you take it, sir? I took it because I provide uh, frontline healthcare to individuals. I'm around obstetrical patients. I am through patient care areas itself, and I felt the exposure that I could have to myself as well as to others if I was colonized or if I was infected would decrease it. And I felt my role as a frontline healthcare worker, I felt that the information that I've seen so far to date and everything is changing on a daily basis, I felt safe enough with my medical conditions and everything else together that not only would it serve me as best uh, individually, but also the community in which I work within. 
and being a healthcare provider. So I felt safe, yes. It, it, it should be noted that I also live in the district that the doctor was speaking of, which was the second highest level of dying in the last, uh, fit, the last spike of this, uh, of this dreaded illness. Uh, so this is, um, this is a life or death decision for many of us. This is not simply a theoretical decision. You want Senator to Sanders, can I just make one point, if you don't sure. mind, and I hate to interrupt you, I apologize. Um, our, um, our hospital services, uh, an area that's geographically isolated, and we have 18 skilled nursing facilities around us. These patients who come to us are medically compromised and probably one of the most medically challenged individuals that we really need to take care of. So it was a matter of people that were uh, very, um, very susceptible to the illness and who are not in good medical shape to start off with. So between healthcare disparities, having 18 skilled nursing facilities and multiple adult homes around the area itself, that's why our neighbor, neighbors in our community was hit so hardly. I, I, I see your point. Uh, Ms. Muir, you are a pharmacist, I believe. Yes, I am. Uh, are you, based on your knowledge, is this drug safe? And is it one that you would take? Right, so, yes, I believe that it is safe. I did take it. And I all, on a personal level, and I also have a daughter who is much younger that works in another facility and I made sure that my daughter took it. And part of the reason that why I took it as Dr. Morris alluded to, the location of where we work, the patients that we see, we were in the middle of a pandemic. We had the first patient. We've seen um, what COVID can do to patients. There is really, even with the treat, current treatments that we have, patients can still die from COVID. So I felt like it was a personal decision for me, a very, um, important decision that I needed to make to make sure that I'm vaccinated, to make sure that I can be better prepared to take care of the patients. And as we vaccinate patients, we watch patients for at least 15 to 30 minutes. And we have not had any complaints of the vaccine. Will there be long-term effects from the vaccine? Nobody knows for sure. But also when you look at the treatments for COVID like the remdesivir that we're given, Will patients have long-term treatment? We also don't, don't, don't know. So when you look at the alternative, I think taking the vaccine is really a good option to prevent patients from contracting the COVID vaccine, the COVID virus. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to say something on well, that. If, if, you can, if you can hold for a minute, I'm coming. <laughs> you're gonna get another round. I'm, All right. I assure you, you're gonna get another round. Uh, but I have one more doctor who wanted to weigh in uh, and I, I, I respect the man so much, I will not crucify his name. He, I will let him give his name and, and, and speak of himself. Uh, please, doctor, the show is yours. Thank you. So um, thank you, Senator Sanders. Really, I appreciate um, your inviting me to this audience. And my name is Benga Gedegbe. I'm a professor of medicine and population health in the Department of Population Health at NYU, that's New York University Grossman School of Medicine. But I'm also a leading scientist in health disparities research. Most of my work has focused on developing strategies to reduce the racial gap in mortality between blacks and whites as it relates to chronic diseases. And we focus all of our work for the most part on cardiovascular disease with my group. Recently though, a lot of us, as you all know, has been doing a lot of work around COVID. I have to respectfully disagree that we have issues with the vaccine. And we need to understand a couple of things. The question you asked, Senator, is given the speed with which this was developed, is it safe? And I, I, I understand and I respect the views of, of my colleagues on the panel. Um, informed consent truly matters. And yes, it is true that previously in developing these vaccines, it takes a longer time. I am old enough to know what polio is. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in a country called Nigeria, where when you go to school, you see your friends um, who are afflicted by polio. 
the polio vaccine made a big difference. In the era of today, the safety of this vaccine cannot be any better, any worse than any other vaccine in the history of medicine that we've done. Its safety is being well vetted, both by institutions as well as by the Food and Drug Administration. As was said by Mr. Bigtree, the study was done um, as a placebo control. In other words, some people get the vaccine, others get something that sounds like the vaccine, um, and they don't really know what they're getting. That is the gold standard for doing this study. So let's be very clear. To the point of, it took this only nine to 10 months to make this happen. Here's why. Technology. There are three reasons that people don't talk about enough. For the past 20 years or more, we've been trying to figure out how to develop vaccines in a much faster way. The technology has advanced. There's no question about that. That technology advancement allowed us to make the process to be much more sequential, I mean, to be much more parallel. In other words, the series of steps that you go through, the experiments you have to conduct to get there. You don't have to wait for one step to finish before you go to the other. Everything can be done in parallel. That caused the number of years by about two years. The candidate vaccine that you're looking for, also with the technology, you cut it down as well. And then the last thing I think is very important, the third point I should say is that when you have the whole world, the whole world focusing on just one discovery with all of the infrastructure that we have in place across the world for the HIV vaccine development, which we haven't found yet. Yep. And you take all of that and unleash that to address this one issue. That's what the speed is all about. And finally, money. Money, the ton of money that was invested to make sure we crack this code. So let's talk about what exactly the vaccine is because we heard about the mRNA. So the idea is this, um, this will take us back to biology and Senator Sanders, don't worry, uh, I will make sure I deliver this in as, yeah, as I'm talking to my, to my 15 year old, um, who, is, who is a sophomore. Who is smarter than me, but go ahead. The way our body works, is that our body is programmed um, through the cells that make up the body. And in the core of that cell is something called the DNA. The DNA really is, if you may, is the coder for the body. It tells us which proteins they want to make, which proteins that will allow us to do, perform certain functions. But the way it does that is it has a messenger. And that messenger is what it tells how to make that protein. That messenger leaves the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell, so leaving your room to the corridor. And then you make what you have to make and then come back into the body. That messenger is very unstable. Once it does its job, it moves on. So the technology for a very long time to try to cure cancer and all kinds of other viral illness is that can you code, can you send that same messenger RNA, that's what they call it. Is there a possible way to be able to inject that into cells and then program it to produce the proteins that is desired? That's what this vaccine is all about. The mRNA, we know the sequence of the virus already. That's been coded. That was coded right away. There was no problem in doing that. Again, technology makes that pretty faster to do these days. You take that messenger RNA and that's what's injected in the vaccine. But because it's so unstable, you, you cover it with some proteins, I mean, with some, with some sugar and some fat, so it can, it can easily enter the body. The moment it enters the cells, it makes the spike protein. That protein is the sharp protein you see on the, on the, on the picture of the COVID virus. And what happens is that that is, this, that is the protein that the, that the virus uses to enter the cells. If you can then develop antibody against that, then you're okay. The old days, the way vaccine is being developed is you take the virus itself, as Mr. Bikri said, you kill it and then inject into the body. Or if you don't kill it, you reduce its ability to cause severe right. illness yep. and then you inject it. Or you use it, with, you, you grow it on all kinds of culture. 
So there's nothing inherently, if anything, different other than this time you're telling the body to make the protein. And once that protein is made, it leaves and then that messenger RNA dissolves. So in my mind, if you look at all the safety of vaccines, it's the most safe. If you look at the effectiveness, 94% for one, 95% for the other one. That's fabulous. The flu vaccine that we all take is only 60 to 70% effective. Now, to the point about, you know, is emergency use. That's true. But think about this, ladies and gentlemen. We live in a very, very, very different, diff difficult and different time. A pandemic that is killing us in this country. 400,000 people dead. What are we to do? Not do anything? Absolutely not. And it's killing people across the world. So the idea that, you know, we have to wait 10 years to be able to attack this, to me, is just absurd. I took the vaccine already. I'm taking my second dose on Sunday. I'm a black man, and I've seen what this disease has done in the black communities. And to be clear, a lot of black scientists were also involved in the development of this vaccine. Kudos to Dr. Corbett, who actually was an African-American woman who was major person thinking about that technology. Kudos to Dr. Hildred. So we have Mehari University, HBCU Medical School. We have Howard, we have Morehouse, we have National Black National Association, we have the NMA, and then we have Charles Drew University, which is again a black medical school, um, HBCU in, in LA. This has all been sanctioned in a way that actually proves that this is truly safe. I think the difficulty is that we don't talk about this enough. We don't have this kind of conversations where we can be open and truly talk about the, 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 the concerns that people may have. So yeah. I'm glad that you mentioned some of those concerns, sir. I certainly was going to mention that this country has a, uh, a history of, of uh, bad medical practices with many different communities, especially the black one. I was going to mention that, uh, but I will mention that uh, I actually understood the analogy that you were using. I, I was surprised that I understood what you were saying. Uh, and had you been a teacher of mine, I would have stayed at NYU when I went there. Uh, I'm going to hear from Barbara, and then we'll go to Dell. Uh, and then uh, don't, don't worry, Dr. Morris, I'm coming back to you. But Barbara wanted to get in here. Yeah. Thank you for your patience, Barbara. Well, you know, I, I do remember polio as well. My father had polio as a child and attended kindergarten with a crutch. Um, I received in the 1950s the first polio vaccines, uh, but I also understand risks are associated with the vaccines. I have a vaccine-injured son. Um, it's true that the COVID-19 mRNA vaccines inject synthetic messenger RNA into the body that contain the genetic instructions for the vaccinated person's own cells to produce the vaccine antigens and generate an immune response. But it is also true that this is an entirely new way to make vaccines a technology that has never been licensed for use in humans. And I think it's important to acknowledge that the phase one, two, and three clinical trials of these two messenger RNA vaccines were accelerated to fast track uh, and were issued the EOA uh, even though the, the, the trials did not demonstrate that the vaccines do more than prevent moderate to severe symptoms of COVID-19. In other words, few people understand that the companies did not investigate or demonstrate that the vaccines prevent infection and transmission of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The World Health Organization and U.S. health officials have recently acknowledged that they do not know if these vaccines prevent vaccinated people from becoming asymptomatically infected with the new coronavirus and transmitting it to other people, which is a very important fact to remember when arguments are made that COVID-19 vaccines should be mandated in order to end the pandemic. Because if a vaccine cannot prevent viral infection and transmission, then there may be a reduction 
in the symptomatic disease and complications, which is very important, no question. But robust vaccine-acquired immunity, herd immunity, will be very difficult to achieve, even with high vaccination rates, especially if the virus mutates, which apparently it has already done. And I just like to, you know, end uh, my my part with saying that the social contract that we have with each other, when we live in communities, whether we belong to a majority or a minority, is to care about and protect every individual living in the community. One size fits all vaccine policies and laws which fail to respect biodiversity and force everyone to be treated the same place an unequal risk burden on a minority of unidentified individuals unable to survive vaccination without being harmed. And a law that requires certain minorities to bear a greater risk of injury or sacrifice their lives in service to the majority is not just or moral. Compassionate public health laws that protect parental and human rights will include flexible medical, religious, and conscientious belief vaccine exemptions to affirm the informed consent ethic and prevent discrimination against vulnerable minorities. I thank you very much, Senator, for uh, holding this because I agree we have to have an open public discussion about these issues because when we don't do that, people feel disenfranchised. They feel like they, that, that the infrastructure doesn't care about them. And that's when you have the loss of trust in the public health system. As an aside, Barbara, uh, that bill in the New York State Legislature to uh, mandate is probably not going any place. Uh, I, among others, will be against uh, forcing people to do it. Uh, you just can't force people. I understand, but you can't force people to do. Uh, I understand. Now, um, Mr. Big Tree. What, what say you to my community, which is a community of color that did the second most, we did so much dying. It was so, I mean, I can't even put it in words how much death we had out here. Uh, we, we never will recover from this stuff. Uh, we, we weren't in good, we weren't in a good place before this. We're absolutely not. And I mean, we got all of this. America 400 years <laughs> is all in my one little community. And we got a bunch of stuff. Now, what am I? I'm their representative, their state representative. What do you suggest that I tell people who are dying like flies, sir? First of all, uh, those are horrific circumstances and my heart goes out to those families that are experiencing that. Um, I wanna also say to the esteemed doctor that gave a very good breakdown of the future of this vaccine, I am a fan of science and I think it is very exciting the technology that we are discussing here. But as the doctor pointed out, there was a lot of if the RNA could send this message, then blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of ifs and assumptions that are taken to making this brand new technology work. And so to speak to the danger of this vaccine, I wanna bring up one very specific danger that was seen in every animal trial for the 20 years we've attempted the coronavirus vaccine that led to the death of multiple animals, including an entire cat study where every cat died. The truth is that the history of this vaccine has been horrific in the animal trials. I am all about having an emergency use authorization. I think everybody should be informed. And if they're informed, they should be allowed to assess whether they wanna take on the risk of the vaccine or this illness. But I wanna be clear about what I think the greatest risk of this vaccine is so true informed consent can take place. The problem that was experienced for 20 years in the animal trials was never alleviated. And when we went into warp speed was what I'm showing you here. Immunization with SARS coronavirus vaccine leads to pulmonary immunopathology on challenge with SARS virus. What took place is when we gave the animals these vaccines, in, you know, what they created antibodies. It looked like it was safe. Please take down the slide now. I'll, I'll get to that point. 
it looked like it was safe, but then we take animal trials a step further than we do with human trials, where we challenge the animal with the virus. They'd had the vaccine, their bodies were creating antibodies, it looked very safe. Then when we challenged with the virus, meaning we injected the virus into the animals, every single time something diabolical happened. The antibodies didn't protect the animals. In fact, they exacerbated the virus. They helped draw it into the cells faster and created what was called a cytokine storm. What this means is a total immune system shutdown. This led to death, it led to organ failure, and it happened multiple times. This has been discussed in front of the Congress by Peter Hotez, Dr. Peter Hotez, that attempted to make one of these vaccines. So the problem is, we saw this just over a year ago with the dengue vaccine in the Philippines. It looked like it was safe. We gave it to thousands of people and they were walking around with the vaccine in them. Then when they came in contact with dengue, the vaccine made dengue deadly and it killed over 600 people. That is now being investigated. Here are the articles about that. This is a known problem with this vaccine and with vaccines for upper respiratory conditions. And here is what is alarming. In the trials by Moderna and Pfizer, I will show you they are admitting that they have not overcome. This is the, uh, the briefing to the FDA by Pfizer. They admit right here that the risk of vaccine enhanced disease over time potentially associated with waning immunity remains unknown and needs to be evaluated, meaning they have not determined that they've overcome this deadly diabolical problem. So we could potentially recommend this vaccine, have millions of people receive it, and then next year, either the mutation in the virus or the virus itself comes in contact with these people, and instead of the vaccine protecting them, it actually makes them very ill. It could even kill them. We could be injecting people with something they cannot take out of themselves once they have it. And I want to really honor the doctors that are all standing on the front line that are part of this call that are assuming this risk when they take on the vaccine. They are truly leading like soldiers, like generals, and taking this risk in front of every, everybody. So I honor them for taking that risk. But people must know that this deadly problem that happened in every animal trial for 20 years has not been overcome. And so you are taking on a severe risk. So then what I would say to your community is we must look at the fact that the death rate of the virus itself is less than 1%. Uh, it appears that the death rate is around 0.26%. A quarter of 1% of people die, meaning 99.74% of us have immune systems that do great against this virus. In fact, all of the reporting is how there's almost no symptoms in most people. We have to get tested to find out whether we have symptoms. Now, to your community, that may not be necessarily true. You are in a higher risk community, and there I would question why we are taking a totally untested, brand new technology that has a known history of killing animals in animal trials, but denying your community products like ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine, especially that has 60 to 70 years of safety uh, in its, uh, even in Africa, amongst your community being used, and we are seeing very low rates of COVID-19 deaths when we look at communities that use hydroxychloroquine on a constant basis in malaria stricken well, let me, areas. Let me, let me raise that question to these doctors, but okay. just one, one point, and that point is just in curiosity, have you taken the vaccine, uh, Mr. Bigtree? No, I will never take a product that has not been properly. Safe. I just wanted to just wanted to rule it in or out. I will be Dr. Morris, you've yes, heard. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to wait. You've heard back a bunch of stuff. Are, are you saying that you took the vaccine? Do you want to go get your blood pumped or whatever else you could do at this point? Maybe no, I go to the other doctors and get something to counter it. Well, I certainly uh, respect everyone's opinion because they're entitled to it. Um, I like to join the Dr. Obegbe uh, camp in the respect of he's given a great presentation on population health. He talked about the mechanics of the vaccine. And we talk about the, the, the pros, the benefits, and the cons associated with it. As we take a look at our patient population, we look at the armamentarium we have against what uh, Mr. Bigtree had called a deadly diabolical disease. And it's one, one small component of what we can offer our patient population. Uh, we are not forcing on anybody else. We're offering them the ability to take a look at the risks, the benefits, and the alternatives. 
I would proudly and do it again, be vaccinated, especially working in the community in which I work. I make decisions for myself. I make decisions for other people in offering the vaccine. I don't speak just to the detrimental effects of anything. I also talk about the benefits of it. And I believe personally at this point in time through medical literature that the benefits outweigh the risk for myself. I offer it to the community for information and let them make the decision as far as that's concerned. But it is an, uh, it is a responsibility of myself and other healthcare providers to provide a good comprehensive view of it. But we provide a comprehensive view of it above the benefits also too and the risks and the alternatives together and let people make informed consent of that. Dealing with population health and dealing with certain areas like we are here, there's tremendous healthcare disparities. And we as a healthcare organization are trying to address that. And we don't have the answers. We don't make the vaccines, but we do make the offering of it and trying to make people informed of what they can do and keep themselves safe. We don't always talk about just the negatives because if we talked about negatives all the time, we wouldn't get anywhere. And then this disease at one point too would wipe us out. Can I just interject? Um, well, no um, need to interject. Before. I was calling on you right now. Right, because I heard Mr. Big Tree mention hydroxychloroquine. We have tried hydroxychloroquine, and we've seen the outcome of hydroxychloroquine. So we know that it really does not work. There is no benefits to using it. We've seen so much deaths with so much patients still on hydroxychloroquine. And hydroxychloroquine also has severe side effects. It's not for everybody. But I think I think at this point I, I, I have to I have to respond to Mr. Victory. Because so I don't mean title to their beliefs, right? But the notion that the vaccine that is being used today is deadly is outright false. In the two clinical trials, 40,000 or so people, only one death. One death. So if you listen to what he's saying about true. all of these folks, you would imagine, you would think that this vaccine is really deadly. The technology has been perfected over 20 years. That's not new technology. The breakthrough is that a confluence of events made it possible for this to come to where we are today, to be able to unleash an immense amount of resources. I'm not sure if I get to this anymore. This is a breakthrough right here. The second thing I will talk about is Africa. I happen to be a global health expert. I've given several talks on COVID in Africa as well. And the issue is this. In the early days of the pandemic, only two countries suffered a lot. Egypt, which is in North Africa, and South Africa, OK? African countries shut down completely completely shut down, have a younger population, median age of about 19 years. We have a much older population here as well. There's demographic reasons why that was so. But in the past month, since the lockdown has been lifted, COVID-19 is raging in most African countries today, okay? So, so the point that they use it in, they've used chloroquine for decades in Africa, absolutely. No question about that. Is that why we don't have enough cases? No, it is not. Chloroquine is not safe. If you follow the evidence of the same chloroquine, randomized controlled trials over and over again have proven that chloroquine is not safe, not just as a treatment, but also is not safe as a prophylaxis. And the one last point I will make is this. In this day and age, the idea of the data safety monitoring board for clinical trials is so well vetted, so well vetted to what we had 10 years ago, even, even, even five years ago. There are certain things that just will not pass muster. There's a community board that sits on most of this data safety monitoring board. So when you talk about animal studies, they are that animal studies, not human studies. I would challenge you to provide for us one human study that has killed people the way you talked about the animals in a randomized trial. I haven't seen any, I haven't seen that evidence. So let me come back to the issue of African-Americans and blacks and our black and brown communities. When you talk about the fact that the, the, the death rate of COVID is only about 1%, okay, 1% of what? 
What about the sequelae? I guarantee you, Dr. Morish has seen this as well. The amount of people with strokes, do we talk about them? The amount of those with chronic fatigue syndrome, do we talk about them? The number of people that are on dialysis today because of COVID, do we talk about them? And when you look at dialysis, for example, much more likely African-Americans than other groups. So we have issues in our black and brown communities. And the study that we did that came out in New York Times showed that it's not so much about the susceptibility of the people. It's not about the comorbidity. What we're talking about is structural racism. If you make it to the hospital, mortality rate, at least in our data set in New York City and others in Louisiana have shown that black and white, they do equally well. The issue is do you even make it in at all? People don't make it in because we have hospital deserts. They don't make it in because 75% of the essential workers in New York City are black or brown people. So they're much more exposed. It's all about the exposure, multi-generational household. To say we will not use the vaccine that has been vetted in a phase three clinical trial during an emergency pandemic, I think in my opinion, as a physician, and we not only see patients, but does those studies as well, I think would be a major disaster. Finally, of course, of course, like with any vaccine, there will be post-trial surveillance where we're going to gather more data. Mr. Bigtree showed that, you know, even in their paper, the FDA said they don't know the risk. That is true. What they don't know is what's going to happen two, three years from now. That is true for anything, period. You cannot say what you don't know. And, and so, so to make that a major issue, when you weigh the risk and benefits, I, I think is a, is, 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 a, is a journey going too far. Uh, we're dealing with a pandemic. Our folks are dying every day and it just can't continue. Now, finally, the job of a virus is to replicate itself. Does this vaccine prevent viral replication? Yes, it does. Does it prevent you from infecting other folks? The idea behind this vaccine right now is that the data shows that it prevents severe disease, okay? If it prevents severe disease in you and me, then chances are, chances are, if everybody gets the vaccine, then what tends to happen, the same herd we were talking about, if you quarantine yourself for 14 days before you go out there, what happens? What happens is that the, vi the virus will actually leave its life out. That's the, that's the half-life, that, that, that's the 14-day incubation period. With a vaccine, what tends to happen is that you can achieve that in many more people. And once you can achieve many more people, you reduce severe illness, you gather the herd immunity, and we'll be on our way. Now, we're going to see what happens long term. But all of the data that's been shown so far points squarely to one place. It's safe. It's never been any more safer, 94% for Moderna, 95 for Pfizer. That's a big deal. That's a game changer. Um, yeah. And I would take that anytime, any day. If they allow my kids to take it, I'll give it to them too. All right. Now, we're down to the lightning round, my friends. The lightning round. You got 30 seconds, and I've got to hold you to this. 30 seconds to bring it on home. We're going to start with Dell. We're going to go to Barbara. We're going to go to Dom. Dem same line that we went down. Dell, I'm giving you a, a chance to get your argument together and things of that nature. 30 seconds to put your message out. And if you can, a way that they can contact you, even if you put it in, in the chat. Anybody who wants to contact anyone, you should have your message in the chat so that they can get in touch with you. Uh, Dell, I've stalled as long as I could before bringing you up. Uh, I didn't want you to not have time to formulate your thoughts, although, although when you're I can, you already got your thoughts. Since I cannot, you can. Mr. Big Tree, you're up. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I want to thank everybody that's a part of this panel. We need more conversations like this across this country and around the world. I will point out that there have been some incorrect statements made. My, uh, the esteemed doctor said there was one death in the trials. The fact is there was eight deaths between Moderna and Pfizer in the trials amongst the vaccinated group. 
Currently, there are 66 reported deaths in the United States of America to the vaccine adverse events reporting system that collects the deaths happening from these vaccines in the United States in just the few weeks that they've rolled out. As to hydroxychloroquine, the studies have shown uh, unequivocally that hydroxychloroquine given in low doses, 600 milligrams per day, along with azithromycin and zinc, has been nearly 100% effective in treating people. And whether or not someone believes that, uh, a patient should be allowed to say, I would like to try this drug. And certainly doctors under an emergency use situation ten, like ten that. More seconds, sir. In, in emergency use situation, doctors should be allowed any tool that they want Doctors being denied access to hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin by government officials like Andrew Cuomo and by pharmacists that will make their own decisions. Yes, sir, we're going to leave access to any product that doctors feel works for them, for your community and others. Thank you very much. Again, make sure that everyone puts their uh, information in the chat so people can get in touch with you. Barbara, what say you? Okay. Vaccines are pharmaceutical products that carry a risk of injury or death that can be greater for some people than other people for genetic, epigenetic, environmental reasons that have not been entirely defined by medical science. So it's very important to become informed about the benefits or risks of vaccines, including COVID-19 vaccines, and be able to make a voluntary decision without being sanctioned for the decision you make. Informed consent is a human right, and, and we should be defending it in this country. Uh, Everyone, I would encourage to report to VAERS. That's the Vaccine Average Event Reporting System. Right now, less than 1% of vaccine reactions are reported to VAERS. When you don't report, the health officials cannot do proper post-marketing surveillance on these COVID-19 vaccines. You can go to nvic.org and we will help you report a vaccine reaction to VAERS. I thank you for that. Uh, moving right along, doctor. Let's take a look at our population and offer them the ability to make an informed decision. COVID vaccines at this point in time, is, as far as the medical literature that is out there, is safe at this point in time um, and efficacious for communities of color in which we serve, as well as other communities itself. To put it in perspective, the eight deaths, deaths that were reported by the medical literature itself, put that against the over 400,000 people who have died of COVID throughout the entire, just United States alone itself. I've taken the vaccine. I think it's safe. I think it's efficacious. It's something that's not 100% vetted, but nothing in life is 100% vetted. It's one of those uh, elements in our armamentarium that we should be able to use, as Mr. Bigtree had uh, pointed out, to be able to offer individuals that has been proven to be uh, a very big player in uh, decreasing the spread and increasing the immunity against COVID-19. Okay, my pharmacist. So, so we should throw for... all of the uh, vaccine out and start with others. Yes. So I want to thank you all for having me. This is really a very interesting conversation. But I do support taking the vaccine. I have taken it myself. I had no side effects. I got both doses. The, the alternatives do have side effects. We have, we have worked with hydroxychloroquine and Azithromax for months. It has not proven to work. Now there's a vaccine out here part and we one of the things that we encourage patients to do and we do it ourselves by observing them is to report we know that there's post marketing we know that this is new and that we're watching it too. From the staff members that we're vaccinated to make sure that there are not any side effects and if there are side effects, those are getting reported, we know that this is something that we have to continue to watch as time goes by because this is fairly new. But what we know for now is that it is safe, it works, it's efficacious, FDA would not have approved it if it wasn't so. But what we do know is that hydroxychloroquine and Zithromax has proven not to work because we've tried it. Thank you. Doctor, so bring I, it on home. I'm timing myself, let me bring it home. I bring message of hope and optimism. Mm -hmm. Vaccine works, take it, if given the opportunity. The safety is unparalleled. The report of deaths will report everything in clinical trials. The question you have to ask yourself, is that death due to the vaccine or is that death due to something else? Second question, is that death any more than the general population? And that I think is the question that Dr. Morish had addressed for us. Finally, finally, 
it's important that as physicians, we practice evidence-based medicine. While it is true that our patients will require them to be treated properly, it's important we provide them the right information. Chloroquine does not work. It has been put to rest and nobody should give it for this kind of study. It has huge side effects, hard locks including, and I will not prescribe that for my patients at all. Thank you very much. Let's go get the vaccine. In full disclosure, I was, I was mean to all of you. I raised a question with each of you. In full disclosure, I have not taken it yet. In full disclosure, I am on a lower category. It's, it's, it had not come to me. I'm not considered, for whatever reason, an essential worker. Uh, although I have, I must admit, I have certain qualms about it, knowing the history of medicine, knowing the speed of things, I would take it because I lead this community. And I, as a Marine, we lead from the front. I would not advocate anything to a community that I would not take. Uh, I did offer to be one of the first to take it, uh, but I think that that would have been more for, for I, I don't know, for, for show if you wish, then, and I think that the essential workers had the right to take it first. So I did not jump the line or anything like that. Uh, when it is my turn, I will take it and I will do it publicly so people will know that I lead from the front. Uh, but I can see that thanks to the history of this country, thanks to many things about medicine, I too have had concerns and these, and, and these concerns we should not not that anybody in this panel did sweep under under a rug. We don't do that on this show, uh, but we should confront them, face them, and be clear about them and let people make an informed decision. I really want to thank this panel for really doing some great stuff. Uh, I've enjoyed the, uh, the not simply the African art that you have in your background, but I think there's Chinese uh, uh, in the background also. Uh, and you know, I've been, I've enjoyed those. And I and uh, Mr. Big Tree, what what city is that, Mr. Big Tree? I'm in Austin, Texas. That's Austin, Texas, behind me. Is that right? Yes. All right. I you know, I some good barbecue down there, but there is. Uh, I, I, on another day, we'll, we, I look forward to breaking some bread where we can meet and, 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 and explore the, the barbecue places of Austin and other places. To everyone on this panel, let me thank you for, for you living your life and taking it so personal that you want to get out there and share it with the world. We really appreciate the things that y'all are doing to make sure that we are just not walking around ignorant, uh, that we are walking around with knowledge and, 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 and we don't have superstition and all kinds of weird stuff. No, no, we're gonna do what is right. And Barbara, I'll say it again, in all probability that that is a lead balloon. The idea of just forcing people to take a thing, I understand the sentiment that may help people feel that way. But I, again, I come from the second highest place of dying in New York State during the last outbreak. And I am against it. Uh, I, 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 government is such, it doesn't give you your rights back. It doesn't, you, it just doesn't give you your rights back. You're going to have to fight for each and every right that you surrender. So we should not surrender our rights quickly to any government, Democrat, Republican, whatever else is coming out. Don't surrender your rights. And I close this one because this is, let's be clear. I close this one by, with a saying by that great philosopher, um, uh, George Clinton from the group Funkadelics. <laughs> The other George Clinton from the group Funkadelics, he said, think it ain't illegal yet. 
<laughs> Thank you all very much. A pleasure to be with you. God bless you all. Thank Thank you. Take care of all.